Amina Khan, Nadia Fauzi, Atia Unjum Wilkinson. He shoots and he scores. Well done. Rami Sheikh. <laughs> All children kidnapped by their own parents. I'm better than you. Last year, nearly 500 children were abducted and taken overseas by their mum or dad. Yes, good one. That's more than double the number a decade ago. The loss that I'm facing is like a bereavement. I don't have a grave, God forbid, but I haven't got nothing for Avamana since the last four years. Not a letter, nothing. So I'm dealing with a constant bereavement. When Safras Khan split from his ex-wife, he was given custody of their daughter, Amina. Four years ago, he went to collect her from her mum's. She'd been staying there in the holidays, but she wasn't there. He's not seen her since. Amina had school the next day, so her uniform was laid out ready. This is Amina's room. And it's still ready, something of a shrine alongside books, party invitations and schoolwork, dated all the way up to her going missing. If she comes home and she asks questions about where I had been, I'd say I was waiting for her. And I want to know that um, I never stopped thinking about her. Safraz is almost positive his daughter is in Pakistan with her mum. There are records of them entering the country. He's been there five times to look for her. He's taken out loans, remortgaged his house to pay for legal fees and trips. What went through your mind when you realised that she had been abducted and taken out of the country? Panic, you know, just panic, worry, anxiety. You know, you want to hold your child, but She's just, just that feeling of helplessness. You've got an officer who's calm and cool. I'm sorry, you know, your child's gone out of the country. We're going to get more information. Even if they could track down Amina, Pakistan hasn't signed up to the 1980 Hay Convention, an international agreement on the quick return of children, which means there's no system in place to get Amina back. You transfer your case from the county court to the high court because the child's been abducted out of the jurisdiction of England and Wales. But then as soon as these orders have been issued, that's it. There's an order that says that your child must be returned to the UK. Here's an order against the family members or the mother to say return or provide information and that's it. Go ahead and go to Pakistan, find your child and then let us know when you found her. But other than that point, we can't offer any more assistance. What's it been like being the father in this situation? I think as a father it's extremely difficult because you simply don't get the sympathy if you were a mother who's abducted, who's had a child abducted. And certainly it's a lot harder being Asian and even a lot more harder being a Pakistani male because of all the high profile stories with, you know, Pakistan related to Pakistani men, the Rochdale case, etc. So, you know, I'm dealing with all those issues and I don't want to be stereotyped. When a child is abducted and taken to a country that hasn't signed up to the Hague Convention, it can take years to get them back. India is among the most common destinations for parents fleeing with a British child. We're on our way to meet a woman I've been speaking to over emails over the last year now. What's different about her is that she's the one who's actually done the abducting. I want to understand what makes someone abduct their own child and, and how they can justify it. She's agreed to meet me as long as we don't reveal her identity. This is Army. It's not her real name because she doesn't want her ex-husband to know she's talking to me. Ami married a British Indian man six years ago. She says at first he seemed like her perfect match, but things changed when she moved to the UK. We, we would have four to five days of good days where my husband would be very loving and caring and he would tell me that I really like you and so those five days would be really great. And then something very silly happens and he, he's out. He's a different person altogether. As if he doesn't know that I exist in the same room, it would be like that. There was a lot of isolation, 
he wouldn't talk to me at all. Ami fell pregnant by accident with her son Anish. Is this right? Yeah. Yeah? I would call my parents and my mom would be crying. She would be asking me, how are you? We haven't heard from you. And we call your husband. He says you're not available. What's happening? Ami eventually left the house, leaving behind a note telling her husband she was going to stay with friends until they could sort things out. I want vegetable biryani. You want vegetable biryani? I exhausted all my energy, all my willpower, my confidence. I was completely broken. And then I called my parents and I said, look, I know that you're not going to have this kind of money right now, but can you please arrange for tickets for me, myself and my son so we can come there for a while? And then I, I flew to India the very next day. Were you aware of the, the consequences of abducting your child? I, I, I didn't know the extent. So I knew I was breaking the law and I would have to face the consequences. But what the consequences would be? Would it be arrest? Would it be my child being taken away from me? I was not sure. In the eyes of the law, it's very black and white. You have committed a crime. You are a, a child abductor. Do you accept that? I don't. I don't accept that. UK cases like these of international child abduction and custody battles have increased dramatically. Last year, there were 477. That's more than double the figure in 2005. More worrying for the authorities is that cases involving non-Hague countries have been rising, with Pakistan and India topping the list. It's easy for abducting parents to hide here. More breakups, ease of travel and cross-border relationships are the main reasons given for the rise in cases. Could you send another email for me just to keep chasing it? Would that be possible? UK charity Reunite helps parents on both sides of the abduction. And I think that if we look at last year's stats... Last year, they got more than 17,000 calls. They want better exit controls and police training to deal with this problem. And unfortunately, a couple of years ago, we had three parents, three fathers, who committed suicide. Even for the abducting parent, again, it's that fear, it's the pain, it's the uncertainty, it's the threat of criminal sanctions. But absolutely, the loser is the child. The child who lives in this house was abducted. There are cameras all over this house staring at me. I know from speaking to the owner, I'm on CCTV right now. It seems a bit excessive to have all this, but I suppose having a child taken from you might have that impact. Hi there. Hi, Mohammed. Nice to meet you. Yeah, good. Thank you. Mohammed's ex-wife kidnapped their son, Ramiz, and took him to the UAE. said she was taking me somewhere, like Butlins or something. Then she started driving, like, because you could see on the sign where it said airport. I asked her, where are we going? She's like, I'll be going to the airport now. You're not going to go see your dad again. That's just what she said. What did you say when she said that? I swore at her. It's been quite hard. Mohammed says no one in the UK could help him, so he played detective. I used any means possible. I, at the time, I sent an email to his mum. And there's a way of tracing an email. It's not illegal uh, where it comes from. So that's what I did. And uh, all I got was an IP address for a place in Sharjah. I contacted my cousin in Dubai. He went over and, you know, he waited around. He knew who Ramiz was. His, I also sent him a photograph over, and uh, he located them, and he followed them home. Mohammed got Ramiz back to the UK, 
trained himself in law, fought his ex in court and got custody. They live together in Leicester now. Rami still sees his mum every few weeks. Are you worried that your mum may take you away from your dad again? Well, yeah, I am. But if we were going to go, like, to London or Birmingham or wherever, I'd bring one of my friends with me so she can't take me and one of my mates. The moment she arrives, I, I, like, I sometimes feel I'm on eggshells. Um, I'm watching my CCTV. Um, where are they? Are they still there? Um, and when he returns back in the house, that's when I suppose there's a weight lifted off my shoulders. So yes, every time he's with his mum, I worry, and always will. So you can play swing, you can play slide. In Bangalore, Ami, in the eyes of the law, is now a criminal. One, two, go. British court orders demand she come back to the UK with her son. Her ex-husband has tracked her down, and now every two weeks she has to report to the family courts in India, where she's fighting for custody of Anish. Ah. A travel injunction means she's not allowed to leave the country. Your son obviously seems happy, but he's too young to understand what's happened. What will you tell him when he's old enough to understand? I don't think that I have done anything wrong. How will my son take it? It worries me day in, day out. He's growing every day. He, he comes to me with, with new questions each day. So there's going to be one day where he'll come and ask me, where's my dad? Or, you know, why did you do this? Wow. Is this how you thought your, your life would end up? Absolutely not. I had I had beautiful, beautiful dreams for myself and the beautiful family that I was about to have, as any other Indian girl had. Nowhere in my weirdest imagination I thought about you know, ending up like this. He still is deciding the course of our lives. I can imagine I'm going to returning home, being back here, playing on these swings, playing on the slide, and, and playing in this garden, you know? Um, so that's my hope, um, that she will return. And um, that's, that's what I am... Um, that's what I am... Um,